وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته As always, we begin with the praise of Allah Azza wa Jal by asking Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace to our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to his family and his companions. We've been speaking about the tarbiyah of our children and remember all of this is in the context of the rights of the child over the parent and the responsibilities and obligations of the parent towards the child. And we came to the right, the responsibility of a tarbiyah, of nurturing, preparing and educating our children. And having spoken about some of the principles behind tarbiyah, examples of tarbiyah, we now came to talk about educating our children in terms of Islam and Alhamdulillah, we finish whatever Allah made easy for us to finish in that regard. And now we come on to the topic of the worldly, worldly education. A lot of people might be tempted, and even I sometimes find myself tempted to use the expression secular education. But I actually don't think this is a very good expression to use because it indicates, the word secular indicates that this education has nothing to do with the religion and isn't governed by the religion and, and that's not true. The religion of Islam is one that calls you to the best of this world and the next. And it calls for your children to have the best of this world and the next. And therefore the religion of Islam governs the matters of our worldly lives. It governs what we're allowed to do and not allowed to do. And it also directs us in worldly benefits just as it directs us in our acts of worship and coming near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I don't really want to call it secular education. I'm instead going to call it worldly matters. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he criticized and he rebuked the one whose knowledge is no more than the worldly matters, worldly education. Allah Azza wa Jalla said in Surah Al-Rum, يعلمون ظاهرا من الحياة الدنيا وهم عن الآخرة هم غافلون. They know what is apparent from this worldly life, but as for the hereafter, they are unaware of it. Look at how Allah Azza wa Jalla rebukes the disbelievers, and and I believe this is an ayah that is very applicable to the disbelievers today. So many people. يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا They know what is apparent from this worldly life. And that includes things like science. Science deals with observation primarily. Things that can be observed and tested and repeated. And ultimately that is ظاهر. That is ظاهرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا That is what is apparent from the worldly life. But as for the matters of the hereafter, they are unaware. So whatever you teach your children from the matters of this worldly life, it should never ever be at the exclusion or it should never be to the exclusion of the religion of Islam so that they become people who know so much about the hayat dunya but they don't know anything about the akhirah. And that's so sad to see some Muslims falling into this and we know the Prophet ﷺ told us let tabi'unna sanana man kana qablakum you're going to follow the ways of the people who came before you. We see so many Muslims, subhanAllah, excelling in the sciences, in mathematics, in languages, in their careers, becoming, subhanAllah, the forefront of, of their field. But subhanAllah, becoming more and more ignorant about Islam and more and more ignorant about the Akhirah. And that's not what we want to see. If we want for some of our children to excel in different fields, different sciences in the worldly life, then we want them to do so as practicing Muslims. 
And that's ultimately what we want for our kids in the sense that, you know, we talked about the kids becoming scholars and we said that not every child will be able to do that. We want every child to have the minimum knowledge that every Muslim needs in terms of their Islamic knowledge. Not every child is going to be able to become a scholar. Not every child is going to is going to choose to study the voluntary aspects of Talib al the voluntary seeking of knowledge, no matter how virtuous it is. So if our children do go into matters of the worldly life, if they become business people, if they become scientists, if they become experts in whatever field they are, in engineering, in medicine, whatever field it might be, they become experts in that field. We want them to do so as practicing Muslims, as Muslims who fear Allah Azza wa Jalla. And we have to understand as well that the worldly sciences should be a servant to the religion. And it's not the case that the religion should be in a state of servitude to our worldly life. What do I mean by that? These worldly sciences, why do we pursue them? Why, what is our intention? What's our near behind it? Is it just this hayat dunya If that's the case, then wallahi, we have wasted our time. There is nothing beneficial from that. But if it's the case that we do these worldly sciences and we study them and learn them, and there is there are benefits for that in our religious obligations and our religious life, then this is where the benefit, this is where the benefit comes in. So for example, a person learns a particular science and uses that science to benefit Islam and the Muslims, or even on a much simpler level, a person learns a particular worldly science and then they achieve a job through that. And through that, by the permission of Allah, they're able to give sadaqah, to feed their family, to take care of their responsibilities, to avoid debt, to avoid uh, haram income and so on. So all of this is beneficial when your worldly life is something which is a, its job is to serve you in your religious obligations and your religious life. And that's how it should be. And if you keep that near, you can even be rewarded for your studies that you do in the worldly life. You can even be rewarded for those if your niyyah is and your ihtisab, your, your expectation of reward is that, oh Allah, I am doing this action for a more lofty purpose, a more important reason than just for the sake of the needs of this life. Something more than that. Maybe it is so that I can fulfill obligations that you have commanded me to fulfill, oh Allah. So if a person keeps their intention sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I'm learning these things and I'm in this worldly life doing these worldly sciences for something that will, uh, inshallah, is an obligation that Allah has put upon me to relieve a burden or to uh, support me in my religious obligations and, and, and to support the Muslims in general, then this can be something which can be of benefit, inshallah ta'ala. And we have an evidence for that. From the evidences for that is the hadith of Abi Hurairah radiyallahu an, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-mu'min al-qawi khayrun wa ahabbu ila Allah min al-mu'min al-da'if wa fi kullin khayr. Ihris ala ma yanfa'uk wa sta'in billah wa la ta'jiz. Wa in asabaka shay'un fala taqul law anni fa'altu kana katha wa katha. Walakin qul qadaru Allah wa ma sha'a fa'al. فَإِنَّ لَوْ تَفْتَحُ عَمَلَ الشَّيْطَانِ Abu Huraira narrated from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he said the strong believer is better, more beloved to Allah than the weak believer and both of them have good in them. And now we come to the part, the shahid that we want from this statement. إِحْرِسْ عَلَى مَا ينفعك. Be keen for what will benefit you. Be keen for what will benefit you. Always be looking for what will benefit you. This here, a nefer here, is not restricted to the matters of the religion. Rather, it encompasses the matters of the religion and the matters of the dunya. But when those matters of the dunya are nafi'ah, they're beneficial. And that's what we want to bring as a dalil here for the fact that the worldly matters, when they are of benefit in your religion or towards your religious obligations, they can be 
praiseworthy to a certain extent if you have that niyyah and that ihtisab, here is evidence. Ihris ala ma yanfa'uk. The Prophet وسلم, here he didn't specify the benefit. Be keen, have hirs bi haris for what will benefit you. Be keen for what will benefit you. The Prophet وسلم, he didn't limit this benefit to the matters of the deen. He didn't say, for example, ihris ala ma yanfa'uk fi deen. Be keen for what will benefit you in the religion. Rather, he kept it open. Anything that will benefit you. And from this is an evidence of the permissibility of teaching our children worldly matters. If those matters are mimma yanfa' wa la yadur, from the matters that benefit and they don't harm, they're beneficial. So from the beneficial matters, it is permissible, based on this hadith, it is permissible for us to teach our children beneficial worldly matters. Ihris ala ma yanfa'uk. Be keen for what will benefit you. Wasta'in billah and seek the help of Allah. And subhanAllah, look how the religion is integrated into everything. The religion is integrated into everything that we do. Even if you are seeking a benefit for the worldly life, in the worldly life, you still, you still seek the help of Allah. Wasta'in billah. Seek the help of Allah. Because Allah Azawajal is the one that controls the matters of the dunya and the akhirah. Everything is in the hands of Allah. And you can't achieve anything without Allah's help. We talked about that in the hadith of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma and the tarbiyah the Prophet gave to him. Wala ta'jiz. Don't ever feel that you can't achieve it. Don't ever feel you've been defeated. Don't ever give up and stop working and say that, oh, you know, I'm ajiz, I can't do it. I can't do it. it can't be done. Have big lofty goals. But make sure that you're not getting deluded also in the dunya. Make sure that, you know, sometimes we have such lofty goals in the dunya and such high aspirations, but we don't have those aspirations in the deen. And we trick and lie to ourselves. We tell ourselves lies. We tell ourselves that, it'll, you know, I'm doing this to benefit the Muslims. I'm working 14 hour days to benefit the Muslims. And in reality, it's taking you away from more important things like knowledge and so on. Well, I tell you, just don't ever feel that you can't do it. Well, in and if something happens to you, don't say if only I did this, it would be like this and this. Don't say if this happened, it would have been like that. If only like this, it could have been like that. But say it was the decree of Allah and He does whatever He wills. Qadarullahi wa ma Because saying if only opens the door to the actions of the shaitan. So I believe this hadith is a fundamental principle as it relates to the issue of teaching your children everything that benefits them, including matters of the worldly life, as long as those matters of the worldly life are beneficial, and those matters of the worldly life are uh, matters that, inshallah, don't harm them and don't bring them away from Islam, but they're matters that are from the things that everybody has to deal with. And we know in the hadith of Hanzala al-Asadi, radiallahu uh, an. Uh, he, he mentioned, he said that when we are with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yudhakkiruna bin nari wal jannah he reminds us of the fire and he reminds us of paradise as though the two of those things are in front of our eyes and when we leave from the Messenger of Allah he said to the Prophet فَإِذَا خَرَجْنَا مِنْ عِنْدِكَ when we leave from where you are عَافَسْنَا الْأَزْوَاجَ وَالْأَوْلَادِ وَالْضَيْعَاتِ فَنَسِيْنَا كَثِيرًا he said that we become busy with our wives and our children and our worldly life, business and so on. And we forget much of what the Prophet ﷺ said. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, لَوْ تَدُومُونَ عَلَى مَا تَكُونُونَ عِنْدِي وَفِي الذِّكْرِ لَصَافَحَتْكُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ He said that if you were to remain in that state that you are like when you are with me, the angels would shake your hands on the roads and in your beds. He said, وَلَكِنْ يَا حَنْظَلَ سَاعَةً وَسَاعَةً But oh Hanzala, there is a time for this and there is a time for that. And he said it three times, صلى الله عليه وسلم, سَاعَةً وَسَاعَةً سَاعَةً وَسَاعَةً سَاعَةً وَسَاعَةً There's a time for this and a time for that. A time for this and a time for that. A time for this and a time for that. So that's from the evidence that there is an allowance. وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Don't forget your portion of the dunya. There is an allowance for the worldly life. And educating your children as it relates to the worldly life is not a bad thing as long as that is at the right place and the right time 
and in the right way. So it's at the right place, the right time, and the right amount. It's not excluding the religion. So they become like those people that Allah said about them, They know the apparent nature of this world, but they're unaware when it comes to the hereafter. And it's at the right amount and the right time. And it's from those things which benefit them. Look and be keen for what will benefit you. And we have another evidence in the statement of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu an. He said, "Allimu awladakum al-sibaha wal-rami wal-furusiyah." He said, "Teach your children swimming and al-rami, which is archery or shooting, and al-furusiyah, horse riding." And all three of these things are from the worldly life. They are matters of worldly knowledge. But they're matters of worldly knowledge that have the potential to benefit in terms of Islam. All of those have the potential to benefit the Muslim. Either to benefit them in their personal life, like swimming, which could be an essential skill, like an essential life skill. So from this we could take the importance of teaching our children worldly skills that will benefit them in their life. Life skills could be things like leadership or things that might help them in terms of keep them safe, like uh, swimming, for example. Uh, or it could be anything that is you know, beneficial, that is a beneficial skill that a, a child can learn from the matters of the worldly life. So to teach them a sibaha, teach them swimming. And as for al-rami and al-furusiyah, these are both related to war because the Muslims in that time, that's what they used to fight upon. They used to fight upon horses and they used to fight with arch with uh, archery, firing bows and arrows. So ultimately, an arami is a general word for anything that is anything that's shot, whether it's an arrow or anything else. So ultimately, these are things that are in the worldly life, but they're things which relate to the religion. So you're teaching your children something which will benefit them in their life or will benefit Islam and the Muslims one way or the other. These are the kind of worldly beneficial things that we should be looking to teach our children. And so I would say from the most important of the worldly knowledge that you can teach your children is one of two things. Number one, the things that will benefit them personally in their life could be a life lesson, could be a life skill like uh, leadership or uh, working as part of a team, um, or it could be uh, a skill of like presenting your ideas or something like that. It could be something like swimming. And likewise, anything which will benefit Islam and the Muslims from it. Because if you look at the statement of Umar here, it's either something which will benefit them personally in their life, provide to, and prove to be a great benefit to them in their life, or something which will benefit the Muslims, like the examples that Umar gave here of Ar-Rami and Al-Furusiyah. And also even the issue of uh, things like exercise and uh, keeping fit and healthy are still things which are beneficial for you in your deen. Because if you can keep your children healthy and they are fit and they, they, they exercise well, then inshallah ta'ala this is more likely that they will be able to worship Allah Azza wa Jal for longer. They will be inshallah ta'ala more healthy and, to, and able to do their ibadat in a better way with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the kind of worldly things that we should be giving the most concern to. Things that will benefit them in of themselves uh, and things that will benefit Islam and the Muslims. So now I want to come in the last part of this episode to talk about our children and school. And in the next episode, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to talk specifically about homeschooling. And we had some questions on that from uh, some of the students who are following the course. They were asking about homeschooling and what is your advice about homeschooling. So inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to give a nasiha, inshallah, in the next episode uh, as comprehensively as I can as to how to start homeschooling your children and some of the benefits of homeschooling, inshallah. But right now, I want to address in this episode the majority of, of, of our children go to school. And I want to start with an ayah uh, in terms of my advice to the parents whose children go to school. I want to start with an ayah 
Allah Azza wa Jal said, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. All you who believe, save yourselves and your family from a fire. وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةُ Whose fuel is men and stones, Al-Ayah. So subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa Jal commanded us to protect our families to the maximum extent possible. And Allah Azza wa Jal told us, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Have taqwa of Allah as much as you can. And I believe these are two essential elements of how a parent can nurture their child in the worldly sciences when the child is in school. The first one is saving your family from the fire. The second one is having as much taqwa as you can. So when it comes to saving your family from the fire, we're talking about protecting your children from the things which could cause them to be from the people of the fire. And ultimately, there are two things which cause a person to be from the people of the fire if we categorize all of the sins into two categories. And they are shahawat and shubuhat. They are the desires that come from the nafs and the shaitan stokes them up in the nafs al-ammaratun bisu'at the soul is constantly inclined towards evil. The desires for things that are wrong and things that are evil and things that are blameworthy. And then there are shubuhat and the shubuhat are confusion, misconceptions, things that are, they have shabahun bil haq, they resemble the truth but they're not true. Uh, sort of, uh, you can call them false notions, misconceptions, misguidance. And these really are the two that are alluded to in the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, إِنَّا عَرَضْنَا الْأَمَانَةَ عَلَى السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَالْجِبَالِ فَأَبَيْنَ أَنْ يَحْمِلْنَهَا وَأَشْفَقْنَا مِنْهَا وَحَمَلَهَا الْإِنسَانِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ ظَلُومًا جَهُولًا At the end of Surah Al-Ahzab, that we offered the responsibility to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, they declined it, they were fearful of it, and mankind took it on. Indeed, he was incredibly oppressive and incredibly ignorant. The oppressiveness is when you know something that it, you know it's wrong, you understand that it's wrong, but your desires, you crave it. And as for the ignorance, it is when you become confused by doubts and misconceptions and misguidance. And this is also alluded to in Surah Al Fatiha. Not the path of those whom your anger has that your anger has come upon, O Allah. And those who Allah's anger has come upon are those who know the truth and they continue in the falsehood. And the Dalin, they are those people who don't know the difference between what is true and what is false. So ultimately, there are two things that misguide. Man, mankind in general. The first is shahawat, desires, and craving for things that are wrong. And the second are shubuhat, which are misconceptions, misguidance. And we need to do our very, very best to protect our children from that. And there is something that I sometimes hear people say, and it is from the worst and from the, the, the greatest examples of ignorance and the worst examples of foolishness that we hear people say is they say, expose your children to, a, to some of the haram so that, you know, like they won't, they won't go out of control and, and they won't go into the haram after that. You know, give them a little bit of haram. So give them something. Don't restrict them from the haram completely. And there's enough to refute the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Or you who believe, save your family, your, save yourselves and your family from a fire whose fuel is men and stones. How does this? How do you reconcile between this and between allowing your children just to do, you know, allow them twenty percent of the haram to save them from the eighty percent? Which of the Sahaba did this? Which of the Tabi'een and the Salaf al-Salih they told you that this is the manhaj of tarbiyah? Well, ahad minhum, none of them, not even one. This is just nothing but the the confusion and the deception of the shaitan. Rather, your job is Allah, as, as Allah said, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Have as much taqwa as you can. You don't know the sin that is going to put you or your children into the fire. It could be something very small. 
The Prophet said, لا تحكرن من المعروف شيئا. Don't belittle any good deed. And Al-Hafid ibn Hajar, he commented on this, Rahimullah ta'ala, and he said, a person doesn't know the good deed that will that could be the one that brings them to Jannah, or the sin that could be the one, even the small sin, that could be the one that puts them in the fire. So it's not for a person to belittle the good deeds or to belittle the sins or to see the sins as being too small. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us, إِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحَقَّرَاتِ الذنوب. He said, keep away from the sins that people consider to be very, very small, very insignificant. So ultimately, we have to do everything we can to protect our children in every way that we can, from the shahawat and from the shubahat. But ultimately, when we're talking about the setting of, of schools and education institutions, it's often not possible to get things the way that we would like them to be perfectly. And that's why my advice genuinely is to all parents, nasiha, sincere advice from me is that if you're able to homeschool your children, do it. Because I don't know anything which corrupts children more than the current state of uh, schooling and education in the world today, in every country. It is from the biggest of the supporters of the shaitan and the biggest of the things that take our children astray. And I think anyone who opens even one eye to this will see it. Anyone who is even remotely honest will see that the education system in the world today is destroying our children. But at the end of the day, Fear Allah as much as you can. Not everybody can homeschool their kids. We understand that. And that's why we don't say that it is obligatory because the simple situation is that we, don't, we know that most people or many people would not be able to do that. But if you're putting your kids in school, have as much taqwa as you can. So first of all, you choose the best school that you have option, an option or an availability to take. You know, subhanAllah, some parents, they look at the school for what it does in the dunya. To be honest, I wouldn't even give any concern for what the school does in the dunya. Only look, is this school going to be a reason to put my child into Jahannam? Or is this school going to be a reason for me to go to Jahannam? Because it might be me that gets blamed in the sense that I'm the one that chose it for them. They didn't choose it for themselves. Don't look at the school because it has good grades or because it has good teachers or a good report from the education uh, watchdog or observer. Don't give any concern to that. Your only concern, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Save yourselves and your family from a fire. Choose the best school that you can. And then know that whatever school you have chosen, it is still going to be a great fitna for your child. Even if you have chosen the best school that is available in your country and you have chosen the most friendly to Islam and supportive of Islam, still there are so many trials and tribulations that happen there. Because even if the school is at a very high standard in terms of Islam, ultimately the children who go there are still going to be children who not every parent is going to have the same high standards that you do. So your children are still mixing with kids from the school that are, even though the school might have an Islamic ethos or it might teach Islamic subjects or might even be a quote-unquote Islamic school, but ultimately the other children who are there may not all share the same values that you want for your children and they may not have the same habits that you want for your children. And that's why when I say this, Allah, this is the advice of someone who has seen this and the advice of someone, wallah, who wants good for you and for your kids. That I've been in this situation, I've seen this situation. I've worked a long, long time with young kids from different schools. I've seen kids from Islamic schools, from non-Islamic schools. And ultimately, all of them have been exposed to severe trials and tribulations, fitan, and tests and trials from the education that they received in those institutions, even the best of them. Because if it's not the education, then the danger is the people around them. We know the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, المرؤ على دين خليله فلينظر أحدكم من يخالل A person is upon the religion of their close friend. So let everyone look at who they take as a close friend. The people your children mix with. SubhanAllah, sometimes the education system might take your children away for seven hours in a day. 
or more or less than that. SubhanAllah, all that time they're mixing with people, those people are having a huge influence upon them as it relates to shahawat. And as it relates to shahawat, also the mixing of the boys and the girls, the co-ed schools where the boys and the girls mix. This is no doubt opening the shahawat for the kids. It's opening the desires and might say, well, my children are young, but ultimately it's setting a standard and a habit that will carry on for them when they are older. And that's why when we have the kids, even when they're young, we prevent them from what is haram. Save your families, yourselves and your families from a fire. So that is one thing from the shahawat. And then the second thing that we worry about as it relates to all of the schools, whether they have an Islamic ethos or not, are the shubuhat. And the shubuhat are those misconceptions and confusion and doubt that creeps into our children. And wallah, anyone who is involved working with kids has seen the increase in atheism, in agnosticism, in rejection of Islam, in ridda, apostasy, among young boys and girls in schools today. And this is a calamity. Wallah, it is a musibah. It is a great calamity that we are suffering today in schools with young boys and girls leaving Islam, uh, committing apostasy, uh, expressing doubts about Islam. And understand that this situation is an extreme example of shahawat and shubuhat. That's what it is. It's an example of shahawat and shubuhat. And this is happening even in Islamic countries. It's an example of desires and doubts. And I used to believe in the beginning that the issue of doubt was stronger. The janib of shubuhat was stronger than the janib of the shahawat, the desires. But actually, when I came to speak to these kids and, and to understand why they felt like they had to leave Islam, I came to realize that the janib of the shahawat can be stronger for many of them. That their desires, they so much want to, you know, to, to what they see their friends doing and to be able to do it, that they even reach the level where they are fearful or they, they, they feel that Islam doesn't have what they need for, for that. And then they, when they feel that, when the shaitan gets them from those shahawat, what does, what, how does the shaitan cement it within them? How does the shaitan make them stick to it? Through what? Through shubuhat. So the example of this is the child wants to party, wants to drink, wants to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, wants to do some kind of haram, and their nafs craves it, and the shaitan tells them, and their friends tell them, and and it, it builds them up like that. The first time, second time, third time, but eventually it reaches a level where they're craving, they wish they could live that life like the non-Muslims are living. And then along come shubuhat, misconceptions. They tell them, actually, you know, you know, you think that Islam is true and you think it's you're so sure about it, but did you know? Dot, dot, dot. And then they justify their shahawat through the shubuhat. They use the shubuhat to justify their desires. So they say, ah, yeah. So you meet them and they say, um, I don't want to be a Muslim anymore. I say, why? They say, I don't want to be a Muslim anymore because I don't agree with the way that Islam treats women, for example. They say, really, that's your reason? And when you go into it and you delve into it, that's the justification that allows their desires to run free. That's what the shaitan has told them to allow their desires to run free. So how do we protect our children from the shubuhat? If the protection from the shahawat is the, whatever we can give them, we do our best for taqullah from the best schools, we try to keep them among the best of friends, any negative influences that happen, we try to counter them with positive influences at home and through the masjid, the Islamic centers and so on, we do our very best to, to uh, to help them and to give them permissible alternatives for their desires. And the desires don't have to always be matters of uh, the heart, you know, matters of, of the opposite gender or whatever. They can be, you know, desires can be matters of just desiring to do anything that's haram. We look for alternatives, we try to keep them busy, we try to give them permissible uh, things that will benefit them in the worldly life. But ultimately what comes, and of course we teach them tazkiyatun nafs, we teach them to purify themselves and a tawbah and istighfar and turning back to Allah. 
But what happens? How do we deal with the shubuhat? How do we deal with misconceptions, confusion, misguidance? Especially when it can be so powerful in these days, the way it can be presented, the tools to present misguidance have in some ways never been more powerful in that sense. I mean, even if the, the plot of the shaitan is weak, in the Qaeda shaitani, kana da'ifa, the plot of the shaitan is ever weak. But the, the availability, the tools that reach into our homes, videos and so on, that are able to spread misguidance. Um, I will give a few points that I would recommend to the parents from the point of view of nasiha as to how they can filter this and control it. First of all, I would advise you to take your responsibility as parents seriously. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Ala kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun an All of you are shepherds and all of you will be asked about your flock. So make sure that you are observant of what is happening. You're aware of the information that your children are taking in and you take it as your responsibility to try to keep them away from the things that will harm them as much as possible. And when you see that a harm has touched them, you try to remedy it and you try to correct it through the means that Islam has given you. I think from the major things that a parent needs to do in terms of protecting their children from the shubuhat is to talk to your children to talk to them and to know them and their personality. And there are amazing uh, examples of this, to be honest, that you find when you speak to people of parents who know their children. You know, subhanAllah, when the child starts doing something wrong, the parent straight away sees there's a change in my child. I can observe something isn't right, and then they address it. And this leads me to my third piece of advice. Deal with issues quickly and decisively. Don't delay. Don't be from the people who delay the issue and say, I will deal with it tomorrow and tomorrow. Because these are issues that get bigger and bigger and bigger. The black dots become on the heart until the heart is sealed. Or the desires become so much that it leads the person to shubahat and confusion. Deal with the issues as they come. And number four, as we mentioned about being preemptive and ahead of the curve. So try to anticipate the matters that are happening. Be aware of what's happening to kids, other kids who are a little bit older and some of the issues they're going through. Be aware of it, inshallah. You know, help out your friends who, are, who have kids who are a little bit older and be aware of what's going on so you can anticipate the kind of things that might happen to your children and be observant. Because ultimately, if you're responsible, that means you have, a, you have the responsibility of observing what is happening, of observing what the children are watching. And one of the, the, the things I would advise sincerely is to control your children's access to the internet and to gadgets, uh, iPhones and iPads and tablets and whatever else people have. Keep it under control. Now, ultimately, we're not going to say that you should prevent your children from this completely because ultimately there is a place for everything and the world is moving in that direction and alhamdulillah but a person a parent you've got to be you are you are mas'ud you're responsible so you have to keep a degree of control over that keep an eye on things learn the technology so you can learn how to keep an eye and it's not about you know you being intrusive it's not about you, you know, sort of being over the, the shoulder of your of your children, because we spoke about teaching your children the muraqaba of Allah, of teaching them to fear Allah and teaching them that Allah is watching them, but to be aware, not to be ghafil, not to be unaware of what's going on. Be aware, keep an eye on things, keep a look at things, and and keep it friendly with your children, like to let your children that's know that that's gonna happen. And to let them know, make them feel, you know, that it's part of your responsibility and say, look, I wouldn't be a good parent if I didn't keep an eye on you and look after you. So I'm not going to restrict you to the extent that you, uh, you know, I'm restricting you from what's halal or anything like that. But what I'm going to try to do is just be aware of what you're doing, keep a little eye on what you're doing and give you advice and be like a companion to you, be someone who is alongside you. Like Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned, وَصَاحِبُهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفَةً Accompany them, your parents, accompany them 
in this dunya in a good way. So there's a kind of a, a suhba there. There's a kind of, you know, being around them and accompanying them and look, especially as they get older and looking after them and giving them sincere advice. And when you see that they slipped up, as everyone does, we slipped up, subhanAllah, when we were younger and indeed when we were older. And at the same time, so will your children. But you teach your children the tools that they need. And that's why in this series, we mentioned the Islamic education before we mentioned the worldly education, before we came to these matters. If you've taught your children the muraqaba of Allah, you've taught your children to be aware that Allah's watching them, and you've taught your children the how to make tawbah and istighfar, how to turn back to Allah and how to repent, and you've taught your children the danger of doing sins in private, and you've taught the ch your children the danger of boasting of sins in public, and so on, then these are things that will help them as they approach these dangers. And you kept the control, you fear Allah as much as you can, you try to keep them away from the haram as much as possible. And I would say to any of the, the kids who are watching or the young adults and the teenagers who are watching this video and they might feel sad sometimes that their parents are restricting them or they might feel upset, they might feel like, I don't see why I'm not allowed to have such and such when my other friends have it. Wallah, you don't know the good that your parents are doing for you. You don't know, wallah, the good that you, and subhanAllah, perhaps yawm al qiyamah, you, it would take, you will realize, subhanAllah, on the day of judgment, what your parents are doing for you by protecting you from those things. And ultimately, if it means you have some restrictions, but those restrictions are the reason for you to enter Jannah, then what, they are excellent restrictions. And Islam is full of restrictions. Islam has, is full of hudud, limits, things you have to stay within. So a Muslim shouldn't feel upset to have some restrictions placed upon them. And even in this, wallah, I advise adults to restrict themselves, not just children. And, and don't feel, you know, for the teenagers, they might feel like, oh, Muhammad, Tim, you, you know, tell our, our parents to control our internet access and be careful about the gadgets. But subhanAllah, I would say the same for the adults. And the last point I will make on this is be careful about using the gadgets and the TV as a way to get rid of your children just to, you know, get a break from your children. Like, oh, you know, like I can't, just kids are just all around me all the time. Just put something on the TV. Because subhanAllah, you don't know what that's putting into the mind of your kids. And if you see the cartoons, the movies, the uh, songs that our kids are exposed to, and I don't recommend you watch them or listen to them, but if you just go to, for example, Wikipedia, and you just look at the plot or the lyrics for them, wallah, you would see every kind of kabira from the kabair, every major sin, from shirk, polytheism, zina, uh, evil words and speech, uh, the most evil al-fawahish ma zahara minha wa ma every kind of immorality, what is apparent and what is hidden, you would see all of it in this music and these movies, in their plots, in their scripts, in the words that they use, and even in the cartoons for young children. We'd see from shirk and sihr, magic and disbelief, what only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how bad it is, subhanAllah. So my advice is don't feel that just to get away from your kids and get a break, you put them in front of the TV or the iPad or the YouTube unlimited without any control over what they're watching and what video comes next, subhanAllah. This is, this is really a, a really big, big issue. So this is just some advice uh, as it relates to the matter of uh, children who are in school. Of course, it does also apply to children who are not in school as well. It's not only limited to that. But I, I started this from the point of view of the child who is in school uh, because they have a greater exposure to the shahawat and the shubahat, to desires and to misguidance because they mix with a larger group of people in a very uncontrolled way. In the next episode, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to talk about homeschooling. And many parents have asked um, advice about that, how to begin uh, some of the pitfalls and problems people fall into. So from the point of view of the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nasiha, this religion is about giving good advice. I'm going to try to give whatever advice that Allah makes easy for me to give on the topic of homeschooling. And that's in the next episode, inshallah. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Wassalatu wassalam. على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين
Assalamu alaikum. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running, make sure you head over to amauathome.com.